thank you everyone for coming and uh, I'm very grateful to QCWare for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I'm excited to share with you what we are doing at JP Morgan Chase. We created a research lab three years ago. Um, it's pretty unique in the industry and uh, um, we are looking at frontier technologies as well as technologies that uh, are like, uh, uh, they, they can have uh, impact in the short term as well. So quantum computing and quantum communications is what we're going to discuss today. Uh, we're also doing, uh, say, cloud and blockchain, uh, cryptography. These things are like a little bit more reasonable, maybe like uh, um, it's, it's obvious that we have to do research in this space. But say quantum um, computing, quantum communications and augmented virtual reality, IoT, computer vision, these are really exciting things to do in a bank. We have a lot of reasons to do this work. But let me actually focus on uh, um, our work. And uh, since we are a research organization, we actually publish our results. Uh, we want to make sure that the scientific community uh, gives us feedback, extends our work. And uh, we do this also because we want to collaborate. We have a lot of partnerships uh, with uh, the industry and the academia. So uh, we have written over 40 scholarly articles in the last, in, the, in these three years, since January of 2020. Um, you can see like some of the venues here. Recently, we had a paper accepted and published in Nature, uh, Nature Communications, Nature Scientific Reports, and the Quantum Journal and so on. Uh, we have over 30 patents, and um, uh, in uh, less than three years, uh, we have been uh, cited more than a thousand times, which is very exciting to see because it means that uh, the scientific community recognizes that the JP Morgan Chase is not just uh, a bank, but also a technology uh, company. So um, why are we doing um, quantum computing in, uh, um, in a bank? Uh, so today you will hear not only from me, but from other speakers from other banks, the reason is that uh, if you see this uh, diagram here on the left that was created by McKinsey and company, um, finance has been identified as the first uh, industry sector that will benefit from quantum computing, not only in the uh, long term and the medium term, but even in the short term. And why is that the case? It's because we have a lot of use cases. Um, so we have a lot of use cases with uh, exponential complexity. And uh, there is a lot of um, there are a lot of opportunities for uh, reducing that complexity using quantum computing. Uh, there is also another reason, and the reason is that uh, in finance, time is of the essence. Um, we cannot uh, uh, have a comp like a computation that runs for say like uh, three days or something like that, which could be very reasonable in other industries but not in finance. In finance, things have to be computed in real time. So our hope is that quantum computers will accelerate uh, the solution of uh, the use cases that you see at the top to the point that we can get accurate results uh, in, uh, in real time. So the use cases are um, targeting and prediction, portfolio optimization, which we will cover today, risk analysis and derivative pricing. Just to mention a few, we also have a lot of use cases in the area of machine learning. Uh, and uh, I will describe uh, some of them today as well. Um, one thing I wanted to emphasize, JP Morgan Chase has made a pledge to become a company with uh, zero um, carbon impact uh, by uh, the end of this decade, uh, investing trillions of dollars in this uh, effort. So uh, quantum computing can significantly um, reduce uh, carbon impact by uh, being so efficient and allowing uh, computations to be um, executed in a much shorter amount of time. So um, I would like to uh, start by talking about uh, one of the use cases, which is uh, in the area of risk. So risk analysis and derivative pricing. Uh, this work, uh, we did work in this space. We have two papers published in the quantum um, open journal for quantum science. So um, the first one uh, is about uh, um, option pricing using quantum computers. Um, we created an algorithm. Uh, so we, we, we solved this problem using the algorithm called amplitude estimation. Um, the advantage of this algorithm is, is that it has quadratic speed up, which means that um, um, since it's like the, Monte Carlo, the quantum Monte Carlo version of uh, the classical Monte Carlo simulation, so if you need a, a million samples to, re, to achieve a solution with error epsilon, 
uh, keeping the error the same, instead of a million uh, samples, you can actually get the same result, the same accuracy with just a thousand, which is the square root of, uh, uh, of a million. So quadratic speed up is actually um, pretty good. You know, of, of course, uh, researchers, including uh, ourselves, are always looking for exponential speed up. That's the ideal. But uh, even quadratic speed up can have dramatic uh, consequences in, in, a, in a very positive way. So after we uh, worked on, um, on this uh, algorithm for uh, option pricing, we realized that um, there was an important component that we had originally uh, postponed to future work, which is the second algorithm at the bottom. So in order to have the end-to-end -end solution for derivative pricing, we needed to take into account the construction of the inputs for the amplitude estimation algorithm. And uh, uh, this um, construct, construction, as you can see, construction, constructed an arbitrary quantum state requires exponential depth uh, circuits. So um, the fact that uh, there is an exponential depth circuit involved uh, might end up negating the quadratic speed up of the amplitude estimation algorithm. So um, we ended up um, designing and implementing an algorithm for the application layer, so for the input generation layer, the, um, uh, the preparation of the normal distributions. And uh, um, this was the first uh, work uh, that was ever done in, um, um, in quantum computing that leveraged a mid-circle measurement and reuse on real hardware. Uh, we used the continuum uh, quantum computer, and um, um, we achieved an 862.6 factor of reduction uh, in terms of required qubits. So it's amazing because basically, like at this point, the qubits are such a precious resource. We don't have many, but with this uh, mid-circle measurement and reuse, you can measure a qubit in the middle of an execution, um, get the value. It's, it's going to be 0 or 1. Uh, but then you can reset the qubit and reuse it and continue uh, the computation. We achieve the polynomial circuit debt and the constant number of expected circuit execution. So basically this um, alleviates the problem that I mentioned before. We don't have the bottleneck uh, in the uh, preparation of the normal distributions. Uh, the other um, area I wanted to discuss is machine learning. Again, this is just a sample of the papers and the algorithms that we have created. I just wanted to pick uh, some that uh, we're very excited about. This was published uh, a couple of months ago in Nature Scientific Reports. And um, we um, solved the problem of uh, extractive text summarization. So basically, um, it's an NLP, natural language processing problem. Uh, you have a document. So uh, please, like, there is a little bit of math here, but I'm going to explain in a very simple way. So you have a document uh, with uh, N uh, sentences. You want to reduce the number of sentences. This is very important in finance. We have used cases, for example, in legal, the legal department. They have to read uh, gigantic books every time there is like, an, an acquisition, a merger. Um, it, it's also like on a daily basis, traders have to read a lot of documents uh, before making um, trading decisions. So uh, having a tool that uh, extracts the most uh, um, significant sentences from a document is crucial. So um, basically, uh, we have two maps, centrality and penalization, uh, sorry, centrality and similarity. Centrality and similarity. Centrality is a map that uh, identifies the most central, or in other words, the most meaningful sentences in a document. And uh, similarity identifies sentences that are redundant. So what we want is to maximize centrality and minimize uh, redundancy. And we have a constraint. The number of sentences has to be m as opposed to n. So basically, it's a, a smaller number. We want to reduce the size of sentences. Um, this um, can be then treated as a constrained optimization problem. Potentially, we can actually treat it as an unconstrained optimization problem by adding a penalty factor here. So this uh, constraint can be integrated into the formula with a penalty factor gamma. So um, the characteristics of this problem, it's a constrained problem. It lacks uh, simple structures. Coefficients, uh, coefficients are not necessarily integers, but reals. So uh, what uh, uh, we achieved is the largest to date uh, execution of uh, XYQAOA, not to be confused with uh, 
the traditional QAOA. This is another algorithm. It's spelled out as quantum alternating operator ansatz. And uh, uh, we um, used up to 20 qubits of the continuum computer, uh, a two qubit gate depth of 159, and a two qubit gate count up to 765. These are very impressive numbers for a NISC uh, computer. And so basically, we showed how to uh, solve the portfolio optimization as a constrained optimization problem by encoding the constraints directly uh, into the uh, circuits, as in, it's in the case of uh, XY QAOA. Or we can also do a different, uh, uh, take a different approach. We can use an unconstrained optimization algorithm to treat this problem as an unconstrained optimization problem. But, and we use LVQE, which stands for layered VQE. But this has the cost of increased difficulty of the parameter optimization. Um, so this leads me to another algorithm um, for portfolio optimization. Um, so the previous algorithm was an optimization algorithm for NLP. Now I'm not going to talk about optimization algorithms for portfolio optimization. So um, um, the first, uh, let me start from this one. Portfolio optimization via, via quantum Zeno dynamics. So the Zeno paradox says that uh, a quantum uh, evolution uh, can be kept, uh, uh, can be frozen if you keep the measure me, measuring the quantum uh, state. Um, by taking this into account, you can pretty much uh, constrain the uh, quantum state evolution uh, in, uh, um, uh, in a subspace within the constraints. And transitions outside of this subspace are suppressed. So um, we were able to integrate this into QAOA and uh, uh, achieve uh, two important results. It's still a constrained optimization algorithm like the one I presented before. And in addition, um, it's uh, the first algorithm that we are aware of that uh, encodes inequality constraints, uh, supports inequality constraints in portfolio optimization. Um, and we uh, support uh, uh, the NPO class, so uh, NP completes optimization class. The only restriction that we want is that there is a, an oracle to uh, test uh, the constraint. So um, let me go to the top now. NISC HHL, uh, a portfolio optimization algorithm can be cast, uh, pro sorry, a portfolio optimization problem, as any optimization problem, can be cast into a system of linear equations. And uh, it can then be solved using HHL, which is an algorithm that was actually built um, just for um, uh, problems like uh, uh, linear uh, systems of linear equations. So we, the problem with this algorithm is that even though it is very uh, attractive because it has uh, exponential speed up, um, it is very hard to execute on a NISC computer. Uh, we were able to do it, of course, for very small portfolio sizes, but uh, it actually works. And uh, what we uh, did was we, again, used mid-circle measurement and reuse and also quantum conditional logic. Uh, and these are unique features that uh, at the time in which we wrote this article were only available on the continuum quantum computer. Um, and so we executed this uh, portfolio optimization using HHL on the AMISC computer. And finally, universal quantum uh, speed up for branch and bound, the branch and cut, and tree search algorithms. So solving mixed integer programs is very uh, hard in general. It's NMP hard. Uh, but there are a lot of solvers, like uh, branch and cut solvers, that uh, can obtain um, optimal solutions for problems of intermediate size. Um, Ashley Montanaro uh, proposed uh, a quantum algorithm with a near quadratic speed up in the worst case. Uh, worst case meaning that you really want all, uh, all the possible optimal solutions. However, sometimes uh, just one optimal solution is uh, desirable. So uh, we created a meta-algorithm called incremental quantum branch and bound that has universal uh, near quadratic speed up, meaning for every input. And uh, no matter what heuristic has been adopted classically, uh, we match that heuristic and we continue to receive, uh, um, to, to achieve a nearly a quadratic speed up. Um, so uh, um, uh, one more thing, very quickly, I wanted to mention uh, another direction that we took in quantum is the construction of a quantum platform, a software stack. So we support all the levels of uh, 
of, of all the layers of the quantum uh, stack, uh, starting from the cloud interface, applications, algorithms, circuits, and, the, and access to, like we have access to nine uh, different quantum computers uh, from nine different uh, providers at JP Morgan Chase. At this layer, we integrated the um, Quantinium uh, product called the Ticket that allows us to be hardware agnostic. Um, so I would like to conclude with uh, um, the um, problems caused by quantum computing uh, to security. So we know that quantum will eventually b break a cryptography uh, thanks to Shor's algorithm. Um, so uh, the problem is this, given somebody's public key, quantum computing allows to compute the corresponding private key with uh, catastrophic consequences, including being able to impersonate another person, being able to digitally sign document or decrypt documents on, behind, on behalf of that person. So one solution to this problem is post-quantum cryptography. It consists of the classical cryptographic algorithms, not quantum, but classical cryptographic algorithms that are supposed to be resistant to quantum computing. Uh, in 2017, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technologies issued a call for uh, classical uh, algorithms post-quantum cryptography algorithms that are supposed to be resistant to quantum cryptography. 82 algorithms were submitted, and uh, a, a very thorough review process has um, been uh, adopted by NIST. Uh, cryptographers of the whole world are working towards this algorithm, but unfortunately, out of these 82 algorithms, uh, only four are left. All the others have been uh, proved to be um, vulnerable. Some of them, even this year, were broken with a laptop, not even a quantum computer, uh, in the matter of like an hour. So um, even though we believe that this technology has to be used because it, it supports authentication and digital signatures, because it is asymmetric cryptography, we're working very hard on quantum key distribution. Uh, so quantum key distribution is another branch of the quantum technology, so different from quantum computing that actually solves the problem caused by quantum computing. It's mathematically proven to be unbreakable. Um, and the proof of uh, mathematical, uh, the mathematical proof of, of QKD being unbreakable was actually provided by Peter Shore. So pretty exciting that the same person that proved that cryptography can be broken also proved the security of this mechanism. So we were the first company together with Toshiba and Siena to uh, deploy a quantum key distribution network uh, reaching the distance of 100 kilometers, 2.4 terabits of data per second, so usable already in, uh, in production. And uh, um, we generated 258 uh, keys per second for additional security. Uh, each key was 256 uh, bits. Uh, we used the AES algorithm for symmetric cryptography. This work has been published on archive for now. Um, and the way it works, basically, quantum key distribution, instead of uh, using a protocol, like a handshake protocol, for Alice and Bob to agree on the same key, it actually uses qubits. So Alice and Bob share the key as a quantum state. Uh, the two states are entangled. Uh, and then when they measure the, uh, the states, they get the same identical cryptographic key. Um, I'm excited to share that uh, one vulnerability in quantum key distribution was side channel attacks. Uh, in July of this year, we published a paper in Nature that uh, proved how to make uh, QKD resistant to um, side channel attacks. This paper was published in Nature, and it was actually very exciting to say to share this with uh, with, with you guys. Uh, the, the Nobel Prize Committee um, in uh, October, when uh, they uh, assigned the Nobel Prize for physics to three scientists working on uh, uh, quantum technology, they cited our uh, work. Out of the 41 papers cited by the Nobel Prize Committee when they assigned the Nobel Prize, one of them was a JP Morgan Chase paper published in Nature, which is like a pretty amazing for a bank. So thank you. I wanted to finally mention that we are hiring very aggressively in both quantum computing and quantum communications, uh, both in New York City and in Singapore. And uh, uh, that's my email address. This is the email address for the quantum computing um, ID. And I'm very sorry that I exceeded my time, but I will be happy to uh, take questions in the break afterwards. Thank you very much.